the church of what's happening now. My main man is here today, Mr. Nick. Valalanga, you guys like scratching your head. Who's Nick Valalanga? Academy Award winning Nick Valalanga, you cocksuckers. The Green Book. How are you, my dear friend? Good. How you doing? I finally figured out where I met in the whole situation. We, you and I did a horrible movie together <laughs> in 2012 <laughs> that I would not discuss on TV, on this, except for you being here. We did a movie called Jersey Shore Shark Attack. Oh, and yes. I think the next day, Paulie Walnuts was showing up. Yes. Or something. I only did That's the movie. That's right. I forgot about that. 2012. I didn't even do the movie because of cocaine money. <laughs> I did the movie because the guys had put me in like eight other movies. They really did. The guys really put me in like six movies, seven or eight, and that was the eighth one. And when they called me, I really go, we got something perfect for you. <laughs> Jersey Shore Shop. I'm like, oh, God, this is going to be bad. That's right. That's where we met. That's I, what I forgot I met. about that. That's where I met you. Yes. And then I, 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 I didn't know if it was, I kept saying for years, after the movie came out, The Green Book, a dear, dear friend, listen, I haven't been in contact with movies in years. You know when you're just too busy? Yeah. You're bigger, you're you're bigger than No. That. You ever just been too busy to, to, to watch TV? Like, there was a time, Nick, I grew up in the movie theater. Yeah. So did you. Where'd you grow up? The Bronx? I grew up in the Bronx and in Jersey. Okay. You grew up in a movie theater. Yeah, I, were, I was an usher. In a movie on Saturdays, yeah. you can't wait for a fucking movie to come out. That's right. But uh, now who has the time? I wish I had the time to go to two movies a week and sit and argue with you about the act and he didn't do it right. I don't, I don't have the time. You're right. You I, just, I joined that club. You know, you pay one one fee. You can go to three movies a week. Because I thought, oh, are you kidding me? I can get my money's worth I hardly, uh, barely have a chance to go anymore. I used to go all the time. I want to go see every movie that came out. Well, when I worked in a movie theater for years, and the best part was you got free movies. I saw everything for exactly. for five years. You yeah. couldn't wait to see a fucking movie. Right. And now it's like a movie comes out, and you already, I don't know if it's called Jaded, but you see the, you, you see the trailer, and you make your decision up right there. Like, I'm yeah. not going to see that. That's right. a waste of my fucking time. Or you don't see the trailer. And a dear friend of mine, Mike Batoli, who I've known for 30 years, called me for like months. And he kept telling me, did you see the Green Book? Did you see the Green Book? And I'm like, Mike, when the fuck do I have time? You're going to love it. Go see the Green Book. Go see it. And he works with Frankie Valley. Oh, okay. So go see the Green Book. Go see the Green Book. And finally, I think I got on the plane and watched it. It was on, and I was fucking blown away. You know, when they said Sebastian was in it, I was definitely going to watch yeah. it. Yeah. He's my little brother. I'm, I'm not going to watch it. And you wrote something that, Touch the fuck out of me. You know, oh, that's nice. I think, nice. The, I think the movie was supposed to be based in 63. Uh, yes, 1962, 1963. And it's so funny. When I came from Cuba in 65, no, I came from Cuba in 66. But when I was five, uh, from the ages of five to seven, I hung out with an African-American kid. My mother had a bar on 127th and Audubon. And that made me think, I, I wish I could find this kid today and hug him because his family took me into their home. In 68 and 69, you kept to yourself, and the brothers kept to themselves. That's how, that's how, the, it's just how the culture was. That's how the culture was then. They, every, all the brothers had the Afro picks with the fist in them, and they put in their back pocket. You remember all yeah, that Yeah, in shit. New York, the Italians were in one section, the Jewish people were in one section, the Irish were in a section, the black people were in a section. It's just the way it was, because they were tribal. Everyone stayed with their own. That's just how it how it was during the, the, that time, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. But I still remember walking from his house in the projects on 25th Street and him getting shit for bringing a white kid into the neighborhood yeah. and then walking away from 125th. And as you got to 135th, white people would say shit to me for walking around with him. Like they still weren't, right. you know, depended where we went, what color. You know, it was like, what are you bringing him into the fucking neighborhood for? Leave him outside the store. Shit like that. And I, used, and I didn't know. Yeah, crazy. You know, until today, my daughter's six. And if I tell my daughter, hey, what'd you think of the black guy? She, she'll, look, she'll look me straight in the face and go, oh, the guy with glasses on. She doesn't see color. That's good. So unless you teach your child that shit, they don't see it. That's a lie. Because I didn't see it at first. I heard about it years later. When I moved to Jersey, got no choice. When you move to Jersey, they just tell you right out. You respect. Uh, yeah. You know, they don't give a fuck. There's well, no. That opening scene was crazy where the, the two plumbers came over and he threw away the glasses. Yeah. yeah. That was. Uh... Well, it was important to show that because uh, even my father, you know, uh, to show my father in that light. But well, I discussed that with my father and, and we had to show it because 
it shows what was going on at the time. Even though he wasn't a bad person, he was still he was still a, a, a product of his environment and his culture, and uh, he changed. See, that's the point of the movie: that people can change and learn. So that's what that's why. How old that, had, you, that had to be in the movie. How old were you the first time your dad told you that story? Uh, well, I met Doctor Shirley when I was like five. I he, my father took me up to Carnegie Hall, to do exactly what you see in the movie uh, uh, above the Carnegie Hall. He had this amazing penthouse suite with the the grand piano, the chandeliers, all the artifacts, the African artifacts. Um, he came out in this amazingly beautiful African robe. And um, so that was like walking into Oz, you know what I mean? So I never forgot that. And then, you know, when I was in my teens, I mean, he started telling me the, the story. But I remembered the Christmas Eve when he came over. I, I remembered that. I was little, but I re definitely remembered that, him coming into the apartment. What did your family think? Was it like in the movie, that much receptive, pull up a chair? Or yeah, oh, yeah. Once, everybody froze. Once he came in, you know, the first, we have a little comedic moment where everyone freezes, but once he came in, you know, my mother and my family were loving Italians. It's Once someone's in the home, that sit down and eat, you know. So, uh, yeah, I remember that very well. I remember the first time we met on that set and you came up to me and told me he was your dad. I got to tell you something. He was one of my all-time favorite gangsters. And I tell you this in all sincerity. I laid my eyes on him the first time in the Proper Greenwich Village. Yeah. And he said something so deep in that movie. At the time, I was fucking around with loan sharks. My whole life was uh, just just torturing two loan sharks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Borrowing from one, borrowing from the sure. other. And that line he said how come nobody keeps me waiting when they're looking to borrow yeah <laughs> that line stuck with me forever because it's true yeah when people want to borrow money from you they call you i'm gonna be that five they get there at 10 to 5 yeah there could be a blizzard two snowstorms their mother got hit by lightning all the excuses they give you when it's time to pay you the money yeah oh you're not gonna believe what happened my my goat ate the cash the bus went to the wrong place so for me, hearing that fucking cracked yeah. me up. It flowed off his tongue. It, so oh, my God. It really. <laughs> he like, had a little experience with that. It was like the second line of the fucking movie. He goes, yeah. he's back there waiting for you. And uh, Mickey Rourke goes back there. How long had your dad been acting? We started with The Godfather. So uh, um, he uh, was working the Copa. And I guess it, either Francis Ford Coppola or uh, the casting directors, <clears throat> Lou DiGiamo. Fred Ruse, I think, the producers, they went into the Copa to see some gangsters and hang out. And they brought my father as the one who was going to intercede and introduce him to some people. And uh, they asked him to be in the movie. And that was the first movie. And you were in The Godfather also? Yeah, because then once he got in, then they said to him, we got kids. We need Italian kids. We didn't, we're having this big wedding scene. And so my brother and I had to go screen test for it and we got in with like the little kids in the in the wedding scene how was that to oh. you? well for me it was uh for whatever reason it just i loved it from the minute i was there i just knew uh, this is what i want to do for the rest of my life make movies so i always loved movies as a little kid to see it made to be there um it was at the house in staten island to see that the walls were fake one day i saw them taking the wall apart i said what the hell are they doing and then they took it apart and i saw that the wall was only paper thin you know on two sides and it was just wood in between I, I couldn't even believe what i was seeing that this is all fake this is uh it was crazy it was something else you guys were talking about a bad movie that you were both in but you're like and i know you were probably too young but when you were on like the godfather and then the green book that that one best picture is there a feeling when you're on like a movie like that that's like this is gonna be an amazing like this is an amazing this is different from the other movies well, luckily, I've been. I, I I did a lot of extra work in New York. I, that was my film school. You know, I I didn't care about extra, non-extra. In New York, it was a little different. You had people that were doing Broadway, then they're doing extra work during the day, and you got to know the the ads. The same guys would work in New York, so a movie or TV show would come in. It's the same guys. So after a while, doing so much extra work, they get to know you. They see who has a brain on their head, who's not an idiot. You know. Talking all the time, so then look, something would come up. Something was on the set. They need a guy to say a line. They need a cop to do something. They go, Nick, come in. I, and because so, they knew I wasn't 
an idiot. But so doing the extra work, uh, I learned, I watched, I stood back. But I, I was in The Godfather. That was when I was a kid. But then when I got older, I was in things like Pritzi's Honor. I was in Goodfellas. Uh, you know, I, I just uh, what you do Sydney Sydney Lumet film uh, I did. Uh, um, uh, I can't think of the name of it with Sean Connery and Dustin Hoffman. Just every film that they did in the city, I was in it somewhere. You know, Goodfellas. I was um, my father's got a good part in Goodfellas. He was in the whole movie, but I did. I was there for the Copa scenes. I was supposed to be part of Ray Liotta's crew, like he had his own little crew of young guys. So we're in the Copa scenes. You don't really see me. And then I was in the prison scenes. And I'm with Ray. Uh, we shot some stuff that didn't make the movie. But when his wife comes in, I'm sitting like behind him, sitting, watching him from a tail. I'm right there with him. We did a bunch of stuff there. So I didn't get a chance to talk to Ray uh, um, uh, when we saw him last. But, uh, yeah, I did that with Ray Liotta. Now, how long? Your dad passed in 212. 2013. Yeah. 2013. And uh, I'm sure he's missed by a lot of people and whatnot. How long had you been discussing the script? Uh, for Green Book? Well, I, you know, I, I interviewed him in like 1989, 90. Who's so that? My father. And then uh, <coughs> I tape recorded a cassette. You know. Then he said, okay, well, we got to talk to Dr. Shirley. You got to get his side of the story. And we got to get his approval, what he'll let in or won't let in. So I started having long phone conversations with both of them on the phone, you know. In those days, you had the extension, one phone in one room, another phone in another room. And I took tons of notes, and he told me uh, what was what. He told me about the trip, and he said, the only people on this trip are me and your father. So I never want you to talk to anyone else about me. Don't ever talk to my family. This is it. What I tell you, that's it. you got to promise me that. I don't want anything about the rest of my life in it. Because maybe he was thinking of doing his own book or his own movie. Because people say, oh, it's not enough about him. It's exactly what he wanted in. So all that criticism, oh, it's about your father. Well, yeah, of course it's about my father. He told me the story. So I'm telling you from my father's perspective how this guy from the Bronx went on this trip with this genius piano player. But I didn't have more Dr. Shirley in it because he didn't want it. We're going in like fucking Marines. You understand me? Welcome to church, motherfucker. 